Good day, it's Harry Brook here, Ag Fieldman for Flagstaff County. And today we're talking to Grant Lestuka, Forge Specialist with Union Forages. Today, we're sort of hearkening back to his long experience, many years as a Forge Specialist with Albert Agriculture. You're listening to the official podcast of Flagstaff County. So Grant, what about the weather? It's always a concern when it's been a fairly dry winter. So what would you do as far as preparing for the potential for drier conditions in the spring? When you start the year in forages, you always want to be looking at the past and learning from the past as you go forward. And so, especially when it's a dry year, it's even that much more critical. The idea behind it is to try to look at what you had for animals and pastures from last year. Do you have the same acres, the same number of animals? And at the same time, you look at it from a standpoint of, are those pastures in need of something or not? Can I plan on it the same as this year as last year? And if there's doubt in your mind, the time to start doing it, something about it is before, not right. after. Yeah, it's too late, isn't it? It is. And that's where the options of fertility. And I know this year, if you haven't booked your fertilizer and everything, it's going to be a challenge. Fertilizer was certainly more affordable last summer and such. But that is something we always say to people. If you're concerned about the situation and the amount of forage you've got present, do look at buying more forage in terms of fertilizing existing stands. And I do encourage people, if they are going to fertilize, to do so early mm -hmm. and do so in a way that it's going to be impacting uh, uh, and getting a good return on every pound of fertilizer used. I do emphasize to people, don't just use nitrogen. Okay. Because we have seen enough research by Dwayne McCartney, Shabtai Bittman, and others where they saw that when they added a little bit of phosphorus with the nitrogen, it supported the broader leaf plants, plants in many ways that you consider more drought tolerant to maintain themselves in that stand in the proportions they were. Okay. And if you're short of sulfur, really it comes down to a soil test, Harry. If you're short yeah. of sulfur or potassium, but just nitrogen is not something I think I would ever do after what I've seen from their work. I would always try to address more than just nitrogen, knowing that it certainly in their work in Saskatchewan, where potassium is high in the soils. Yeah they found that phosphorus was critically important with nitrogen. And what, all I how say, much would you put as far as, well, I mean, there's a soil test, but what would sort of be the range would be an effective use of fertilizer? Well, the idea that you're going to put 50 pounds of N on is kind of a starting point of solid thought. And then if a person looks at phosphorus, we know it moves slowly in the soil. So the thought that some is going to help and it's going to help over the next few years and stages, I'd be looking again at economics, but having that 50, 25 maybe. And the That's idea actual per acre? Yeah, actual okay. per acre. Yes, exactly. Wow, that's a lot of fertilizer. I mean, for hay, but I mean, the other part of it is too that how much are you taking off every year, right? Well, for hay, you're certainly taking off and you treat it accordingly. And I know that with your expertise, you'd help them come up with, okay, that's how much fertility you took off yeah. last year based on the nutrients you removed from a ton, two tons of hay or something like that. And people that do maintain those hay stands, it keeps on being productive much longer. Mm -hmm. But in a pasture setting, yeah. it, uh, we hope that the manure and urine is going back more yeah. closely to where it came from. And that's why you see so many people that got interested in rotational grazing, managed grazing, because they realize that so much of what goes in the cow comes out the other end. Right. Let's just manage it so that it goes back on the landscape. Not, uh, you know, lounging at the dugout or in a set of trees, 
Um, but mm -hmm. in fact, back out on the paddock where it came from. And when we have a perennial pasture that's got good nutrients brought back in terms of urine and manure because of being water in that paddock or mm -hmm. pasture and everything, then in fact, we find the need for fertility is lower. Okay. So when would be the best time for uh, fertilizing? You said early. How early is early? I think almost the earlier, the better. We're looking at getting out there in spring and getting that fertility on the landscape. So when it greens up, it'll be taking advantage of it as it starts to come to give you the highest yields. Would um, that be frozen soils even? Like, would now be a good time? I prefer later than now, but... Uh, I Soil prefer, being defrosted anyways. Yeah, I prefer late in the fall uh, before the snow flies or in spring as just after the snow's gone and the plants are exposed so that we're not going to get the gassing off. So we're going right. to get the fertility uh, being moved into the ground and everything. Would you recommend using some of the products out there that extend the lifetime of nitrogen before it starts to denitrify? Well, especially if your timing and rain are concerns, that is more important because that delay that the product gives allows for some flexibility. If you could do it right in front of a rain. Ideal. And it's ideal, then you don't need to. But I would look at that as the fertility goes. And then, Harry, I'd move on from there and say to people, okay, if we're looking at starting in the spring, we know that we need the plants to recover from last year's winter. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, that's where we lar largely look at perennial tame stands and say they need three leaf stage of new growth mm -hmm. in order to tell me that they have been recovered from last winter's nutrient that has been used to survive and metabolize and just keep alive. Yeah. If I'm on a native pasture, I need three and a half leaves of growth approximately. And this is work done by Dr. Llewellyn Mansky. And yet when we find, and he's in North Dakota, we find his principles to be solid ones in the grazing community. Mm -hmm. And so the plants are really telling you grazing readiness. And when those plants tell you grazing readiness, not just calendar, then we're more comfortable with it. And certainly when I've got the three leaf stage of growth on a tame stand, now I know that it's about time to consider starting and know that any of the plants that are going to be bitten have recovered from last winter's nutrient losses. Right. And they're more resilient. And that's where it goes back to years ago where the comment was made one day in the spring is worth three in the fall. Mm -hmm. And that work was done, of course, uh, by a gentleman out of Manitoba. And that, that scientist looked at it from a standpoint of seeing that if you don't let the plants recover from winter, if yeah. you don't consume them lightly in that first graze in spring, then they are, in fact, stressed quite quickly. Whenever I'm worried about dry conditions, as could be the case for some of your producers, I'm always looking at trying to keep the plant's roots continually being deep mm -hmm. and, and growing as they chase the moisture on down. Yeah. And to me, that means I had work done by Kreider back in the 50s showed that with a lot of different perennial grass species, if they're they are grazed more than 50% removal of plant tissue above yeah. ground, they in fact start pruning roots. And the right. last thing I want in May and June is to be losing roots. Right. All I want to be doing in the spring is trying to, if anything, challenge the plants to keep a deep root system, mm -hmm. to produce more leaves, so that they are going to be more yield in leaves and other parts of the plant. And with that in mind, that's how we treat a very uh, uh, a good forage stand yeah. so that it continues to be a highly productive throughout a dry year. Uh, I have to watch more of stands that are overgrazed because with them, I have to be more careful even because they are um, certainly struggling. And so with struggles come care and concern so they do recover and do try to produce adequately in that year.
That brings up an interesting question that comes to my mind. If you do have an overgrazed pasture, what can you do to bring it back? Because I know I've, I've told people before, well, you can rest it, but that might take, depending on how severely it's been overgrazed, that might take two or three years for the roots to start developing further down finally. And with that too, what about, you, you get these guys saying, oh, she's root bound, it's time to dig her up. And then they, they break it all over again, the expense of breaking it and putting it back into hay or grass. Or what about fertilizer? Could you please talk about that? One of the things I'd look at in that situation is I would then say, okay, I'm going to have to make an investment. And either I yeah. choose to take it out of production entirely, mm -hmm. or I choose to fertilize probably. And the biggest uh, rejuvenation is rest, but rest with fertility. And for most people, we can't afford just to choose to say, oh, oh, I guess I better take it out this year because they're counting on it. Right. But the reality of it is it's part of a longer term plan that a person makes those decisions in a bigger picture. And so my first thought is that if we're certainly pastures that have been grazed repeatedly without the plants having time, to regrow adequately to recover the nutrients lost mm -hmm. from the grazing incident and they have evolved also to being a plant that is um, uh, tends to be a shallower rooted plant often in kentucky bluegrass starts coming in yeah. black grass might be coming in thistles and, and thistles weeds yes so we're we're looking at a situation where we want to fertilize it to get it started to give it that jump that we wouldn't have otherwise, then give it a rest to get going yeah. pretty darn good. And with that in mind, then we're going to look to graze it probably lightly later. And um, at the same time, that's the whole discussion in itself, I think, yeah. other than saying address the fertility, not just from a nitrogen perspective, as we talked about a little earlier in this podcast, and also to give it that early season rest so it does give you that recovery for those existing plants and that shot of uh, fertility to try to compensate for some of the management stress that has come on that plant and then sit back and give it that rest before you graze it. And right. when you graze it later on, then you're grazing it in a manner that considers it still uh, more carefully. What about using annual forages as a temporary measure in a dry year? Well, and Harry, that's a very good point because if it's part of strategies, right. a person's looking at it and saying, okay, I'm concerned. I don't know if I'll have enough. So then with that in mind, we start in pre-planning. And part of that pre-planning is either I choose to sell some cows. I uh, choose to sell some of those yearling heifers I thought right. I was going to keep let somebody else own them so that it's going to work. Or I can also choose to say, I'm going to plant some annuals. I'm going to graze them. And if I look at planting annuals, then where are they planted and how can I again manage them right. by, but by rationing or budgeting. And I always like to manage annual forages in ways in which I've got a lot of animals on a less land mm -hmm. um, because I want to go in there remove parts of the plants and work done by Arvid Austin and Dr. Vern Barron at Lacombe years ago mm -hmm. showed that the productivity of annuals is greatly enhanced when they're grazed with a manner of grazing and then rest. So still the same idea where we right. go in there, we remove parts of the plants, we want those plants still to have strong healthy roots, and for the majority of it, we like to see 50% left for that strong, healthy root, and then don't come back. And in a, in a perennial pasture system, I only look to graze 30% if I can in my first pass across the okay. landscape. Well, it's growing so quickly too, right? In June and early July, if the moisture's there. Yeah, it is. And exactly the point is that we're trying to harness the productivity and just convert it from seed heads to leaves. 
Right. And trying to take that plant that's going to put up a head to be cut for hay or a plant that's going to be um, trying to complete its life cycle as all grasses, wood or legumes, and simply trying to extend it by the plant now wanting to regrow. And that regrow comes from new tillers, new leaves, and for legumes, new regrowth coming from that. Well, you certainly don't want to be chopping off the growing point of a cereal. You want to keep it at that vegetate, vegetative stage so that uh, you don't sort of kill the plant, right? Well, that's right. And that's why you'll often see people putting in uh, a winter triticale, a fall rye, <clears throat> excuse me, a winter wheat, yep. something that is in fact not going to try to go to seed head. And with that in mind, you mix an oats with it or a barley so that you get that a couple of weeks earlier growth. Mm -hmm. It can come in the stand and knowing that it'll give you, if you go out there and graze it uh, when it's ready, it still won't have a gr an elevated growing point, but it does set it back. Yeah. And lo and behold, you'll have it growing back some and the winter cereal growing back a lot. And if you choose to add anything to that mix on top of that, then their ability to regrow as well coming back. And so it allows you to buy time away from a perennial stand by having animals out on an annual and having a place to put them, a place where you can graze it. And I, I still say, take it full advantage of the yield it can give right. by not simply going out there and grazing it so severely. Again, it's part of a reason that so many of these forage and applied research associations started in the province so mm -hmm. many years ago, back in the 80s and 90s. And uh, Battle River got on board pretty quick. And the idea behind that was producers looking at how can we, in fact, grow more forage so our cattle can grow more? And right. so there was kind of a different approach to things where people started to see the value that comes from a good forage stand and realizing that forage stands are on landscapes that need to be more productive right. uh, as the price of land goes up. Now it's even more true. And we want forages to be a high crop of value. And we do have grazers that are grazing them and getting quite high yields per acre. Mm -hmm. And when one looks at the economics of them, depending on the quality of soil and the landscape they're growing on, they maybe are the best alternative for profitability. And uh, a lot of times, of course, that is, they are in more marginal land. So you have to consider that too. Well, I was I was wondering, going back a little back a little bit, at what stage of growth would you be grazing the annual forages? So you put your oats in with some fall rye or winter triticale. Um, normally, if I used to sort of say, well, about six inches, you could start grazing it. What would you say would be the right stage? Well, it depends on the forage. You know, I'd like it before the five leaf stage. Mm -hmm. on, uh, on any of the oats or barleys and types as such. If I've got a winter cereal in the mix at times, we'd say to people when it's covering the ground. So the idea behind it is going to be about six weeks from when you plant it. Right. And depending on the fertility of that area and the moisture or not moisture, play it by ear. But the oats and barley gets you in about six weeks down the road and the winter cereals a little later. Any of the other different species that somebody could plant are all going to be a little later than that six weeks. But getting in on the first time over, again, looking in a lot of thought that, okay, generally, if these plants have grown to about three leaf stage or greater, they are now starting to optimize sunlight energy capture. So we're waiting for enough growth. And I am a person that is always saying, okay, if you want six inches, like you said, how many leaf stages is that? And knowing that I'm kind of looking at how much it's covered the ground mm -hmm. and yet grazing it early enough so it doesn't send up at or elevate its growing point. Yeah, well, then that, the brings up the, that brings me up to another question, which is, so what would you graze your cattle on early in the spring? 
We've got a number of people that will leave forages from the previous year stockpiled. Okay. And so you've got an existing perennial stand that's out there that had a lot of aftermath on it. And the green's coming in with the dead tissue, as we'd call it. Mm -hmm. And with that thought in mind, the cattle go out on something that was left in a high state of vigor and health last mm -hmm. fall. And it's a really good point, Harry, because I never start on the same pasture the same the next year. The idea behind this is that we make the assumption we're not all knowing. Mm -hmm. Because if I start in the same pasture, the same place every year, I am stressing the same species the same way every year. Yeah. And with that comes down to the species that are the most tolerant probably not the ones I'm looking to have and may be the mainstay of a pasture. Yeah. So the biggest thing McKinney taught me back in the early nineties, equal in opposite measure. And the idea behind that is that we're always trying to alternate what we do. So mm -hmm. if I felt I grazed something in the fall more severely that certainly would not be a paddock I'd be grazing in the fall severely the following year. If I'd grazed it in the spring, I try to graze a different paddock in the spring right. the next year. So I'm trying to manage my biodiversity of species to remain intact and ebb and flow back and forth, right. but keep them in the stand. And that is one of the things we say to so many people that are looking to say, well, I'd like to rejuvenate my pasture. Depending on how it's been grazed for how long, in many cases, it is a challenge yeah. because we have grazed it to the point that the most grazing tolerant species is left. We've but selected for it, yeah, through yeah, our and that's, routine. And that might not be, in fact, never, uh, pretty well never is, the most productive species in the mix. Right. So we're always trying to manage pastures, again, thoughtfully. These are all principles that we could use for extending the lifetime and productivity of a pasture. Absolutely. And that's the point. The recipe is a principle set of recipes. Yeah. And that set of principles comes down to managing during rapid growth stages for light removal so that you get more to remove in right. the year with growth coming and also the shifting of where you are on a paddock and the severity with which you graze that paddock from one year to the next at time. And, and with pastures that might not be as easy as people mm -hmm. think, but in real dry conditions, we often say to people, do your best to group herds. And um, if you feel in many cases that, you know, uh, well, I wanted that bull bred to those cows or whatever, are you gonna be keeping those cattle back? If it's dry and you're concerned, maybe that's a year you don't keep replacements from that set. Maybe it doesn't matter what they're bred to. But the idea behind having more animals together so that they can be managed on all pastures for more rest in between grazing incidents. Uh, right. And, and then we'll find in a case like that, we will maybe even have more grazing than we had the previous year. So... I've talked to, I've, I know some people or have talked to people in the past who have tried to get a target weight per acre per day on their paddock. So that we're talking very small paddocks, uh, high intensity, short duration grazing. And they were looking at 40 to 60,000 pounds of animal weight per acre per day. What are your thoughts on that intensive uh, management system? Well, with that, the the weight per day, the, we've got people that will play on land that's really challenged and struggling. Yeah. And maybe they might choose to take advantage of the kids being home and move them more than once in a day so they can get there. Yeah. So the idea behind it is if you don't have the forage yield to put them there, you, you really can't. And yeah. so when you have enough forage yield to put animals there, it's simply a budgeting and saying to yourself, if that animal is going to eat roughly 3% of body weight, which is a bit high, but 
with waste and everything. If you've got a thousand pound units out there to be your 40,000 pounds, then you've got to have 3% of 40,000 pounds. So 1,200 pounds of material, if I've got that right, Harry, I yeah. think is going to be removed. So you're looking at a paddock that's got enough to allow for that to occur. Mm -hmm. And in the earlier parts of the year, I'm always looking to be leaving more. So if I'm going to have higher stock animal numbers, then I've got to be really looking to move them more often because in the summer, I know that growth slows. Right. And I'm just trying to manage growth in spring so that it is created. And when it's created, spring is crucial to create that. In the summertime, then I'm using some of that as the growth starts to slow. Right. And everything, knowing that, in fact, we have a shorter growing season in this province than a oh, grazing yeah. season. And growing season are two different things. So the idea that, okay, my plants stop growing in early September. Some mm -hmm. people will say, well, I don't have any pasture by that time. It left. Mm -hmm. Others will say, well, I'm grazing until October or November. Well, it simply means that they budgeted in a yeah. way in which they left material for a later use and with so doing, that later use of plant tissue and management for that later growth of plant tissue to be apportioned and used at a later time. You see, it's um, when I was talking about that 40,000 pounds, it was, it was in regard to a, a fellow I knew out near Wainwright, and he was grazing very heavily. And it was interesting because he was in an old hayland. It was probably 5% alfalfa at most. But after he'd gone around once and we'd had some rain, he had a tremendous response in that pasture that had been so heavily grazed. And it was like 60% alfalfa, it looked like. So it almost got the uh, seed that was in the ground trampled in enough and with the right conditions, it kind of rejuvenated itself. Well, and if that occurs the following year or something, but if that occurs this year, to me, that's going to be simply that those plants were present, but very suppressed. Right. Because seed takes a while to grow. Yeah. But at the same time, when you've got plants present, but not allowing for adequate rest or such, we know that legumes appreciate a more of a rest time for regrowth. Yeah. And if depending on management, we set back the grasses more, then the legumes can take advantage of it. So it could be that the legumes had, which they do, deeper roots than the grasses. Mm -hmm. They had access to moisture. They're after he grazed that severely, as you said, with 40,000, he took the cattle out of there. Yeah, And when he did take them out of there and gave rest as part of that recipe, then the legumes had the opportunity to express their potential and uh, back they came. And uh, it's, it's interesting because every year is different in grazing. Yeah, it is. And with that in mind, we know from uh, the work that's been done by Alberta Agriculture, and you and I are not with them anymore, Harry, but yep. the Agri Profits Group um, with Dale Khalil and now Anatoly Aginsky and Bang Lai mm -hmm. are looking at productivity of cow calf producers. And as they look at the pastures those cow calf producers are managing, they're also evaluating it. And it's something mm -hmm. that we looked at quite a bit with our higher leg and pasture projects we were working on with a lot of the uh, Battle River Research Group and others around the province. And what Mang Lai and what Dale Khalil found and what Anatoly found was that in general, the pastures that were higher leg, mm -hmm. the pastures that were well managed were more profitable and they were more productive. And with that in mind, it came down to when we value forages as a crop in my own mind, mm -hmm. it can give us value back. And that productivity was 
varied from anywhere from 50 to 100 percent in some of those incidences. Mm -hmm. And the average was varied as well, but the profit went to 200 percent. So oh. the, uh, the cow-calf producers that managed pastures well, that maintained that biodiversity of species that they had seeded in the pastures, Mm -hmm. allowed themselves to have a pasture that was more resilient in drought because of the biodiversity of species, the different roots on different plants, the plants that are in fact more productive potentially. And uh, all of that translated back to the reason I think so many of the forage associations around the province got started. And that's when cow-calf producers shifted an emphasis to managing forages as a crop of production, they got mm -hmm. that. And then they got the gains they were looking for on those cattle. They right. got the gains per acre. And when Dr. Barron worked at Lacombe with the zigzag project, we called it for, for seven years, mm -hmm. uh, what he found in general was that the pastures, the perennial, a perennial pasture can be very productive because it allows for a set of species that can grow over a long window of time in a year. And Under different we'll see, environmental conditions. That's right. And where an annual could be subject to a drought and not grow well, um, he found that the perennial pastures that were well cared for and managed with control grazing were in fact the most profitable, gave the most pounds of beef per acre. The gains System. on the animals, were, yeah, the gains on the animals weren't so different actually across okay. all the different pastures right. because there was an alfalfa pasture, an annual pasture, uh, a metabrome alfalfa pasture, a uh, old grass pasture that was well managed and an old grass pasture that was continuously grazed. And in all of those systems compared against each other, the benefits started to show in species that can grow over a longer window of time in the year. And in general, that's going to be a, a grass, like meadow brome grass. And that I love example. meadow brome because of that very fact that it grows so long, over such a long period, as long as there's moisture. And it tries to grow leaves versus yeah. growing heads. So not your best hay plant, but a, everybody loves it for pasture. And if right. you can grow it, you do. Others that are in the moisture areas, of course, will look at orchard grass and maybe even now some of the softer leaf tall fescues. But the, the metabrome is a, a, a thing of beauty. I think that the majority yeah. of people around Flagstaff would consider in, in their stands to be a mainstay. Yeah. So you were talking about uh, high legume pastures. Do you want to maybe elaborate a bit on that? Because there was some work done with the, the new Mountain View sand flooring. Yeah, there there was work done. Dr. Surya Acharya, and yep. uh, he's now the chair also of the Alberta Forage Industry Network, which is Alberta's voice for forages. But he is the father of the, the newer Sicer milk fetches that so mm -hmm. many of us like and use in pastures, and the newer sand foins as well. And with all of that, he used some pretty innovative thoughts. And the sand foins were... He looked at them in light of selection with regrowth with alfalfa. Right. And with that in mind, he looked at Mountain View and selected it from regrowth with alfalfa. And so selecting plants that are, in fact, the productivity ones, the higher productivity ones, when in competition with another plant. So a oh. mixture. So he was selecting for a plant in a mixture. And then the other one, AC Glenview, that also came out of that system, was selected after four years of grazing in competition with alfalfa. Interesting way to select. It is. And it was quite, uh, that's why Innovative. we can, Yeah. Uh, he's going to be doing a talk uh, coming up next week. As of course, he, was, uh, he uh, achieved uh, the leadership award for the Alberta Forage Industry Network last year and uh, part of the Alberta Forage Industry Network's AGM going next week. He oh, yeah. got to speak. <laughs> That's part of his. He won, he won the award last year for all his contributions. Right. And this year he gets to talk about some of those things he wants to share. But no, the, the, the exciting thing we found about the idea of the legumes he brought forward and such mm -hmm. 
is that I can't tell you which leg is best for you. Yeah. I do I do know that so many people don't plant legumes because they're afraid of bloat. Right. And yes, alfalfa can cause bloat. Yes, clover can cause bloat for the most part. Oh, yes. But when managed, they don't have to. But the fact that we do have species that are absolutely non-bloating, and that's sicer milk fetch will never cause bloat because of its slow mm -hmm. rate of digestion. Yeah. And sanfoin has tannins in it, as does bird's foot trefoil. Both of those plants are organic bloat control. So Surya has, in fact, found that when you have 20% of a sanfoin in with an alfalfa yeah. in, in a stand, so most people wouldn't be growing 80% alfalfa, 20% sanfoin. <laughs> no. It, they'd have grasses and other things in with them, of course. But his point was that the tannins bind on to some of that crude protein that breaks down so quickly in the room and then travel further down to the digestive tract. In so doing, not 100%, but pretty close, eliminate bloat. So wow. as soon as we start putting grasses with alfalfa, with a sanfoin or birds for treffle or a sicer milk vetch, we now have got a lot more safety to consider. And now we can have pastures that are uh, very productive. And mm -hmm. it's true that the AgriProfits team found that the legume grass pastures were more pro productive and, and more profitable. And I think it's something to look at, too, in our systems, the opportunity even to have a perennial pasture that's highly productive in a stand for a period of time. And maybe after 10 years, it becomes a grain crop land and you switch back. Okay. And in so doing, now, Harry, that's where everybody's starting to go, soil health. And right. so, so many of the people that join these associations for the benefit of learning more about forages now are realizing that they can actually grow their soil. Plants grow soil. Right. And that carbon, the photosynthesis, and as Dr. Barron showed with the metabrome alfalfa, the long season of green is a green solar panel to send photosynthetic energy down. 40% of a plant's exudates mm -hmm. go into the soil. And if we're managing that system well, and we have got adequate fertility, but not excessive, right. we will find that the plants themselves start in the farmer to farmer bartering. And so they're bartering in exchange. So the mycorrhizal fungi becomes mm -hmm. a friend of the plants and goes and gets water from the finest pores, goes and gets phosphorus and other nutrients and brings it to the yeah. plant in exchange for photosynthetic products. So it's no free ride, but it's a bartering system. And that's what we're finding. It's that process. Okay. And you know how it is in life, Harry, both you and I, we, we're never stopping learning. No. And the reality is it's not the destination, it's the journey. Right. And we're finding with that journey, we are building soil organic matter. And that is one of the exciting things that uh, Charles Massey is going to speak also at the Affin AGM. And mm -hmm. I'm doing a, a selfish plug here, but... Um, you, Go won't ahead. Have, you won't have it probably played soon enough, but uh, he's, uh, again, another individual that's renowned around Australia as a producer who has done so many thoughtful things. And when you fly over with an airplane and everything's in drought and somebody's land's green and they don't have irrigation, you, yeah. you, you think to yourself, there's something going on here. Oh, yes. The soil health thing is something that a lot of perennial and annual people in forages are looking at now and trying to get their heads around it. And it's the simply the journey of the plants in the soil working. Mm -hmm. And with that working, they're creating opportunities for caption of carbon and storage of carbon. And the beauty of some of that is we hope that 
producers over the long run with well-managed pastures are actually going to be paid. That would be that, that would be a nice thought. That's for sure. I was just thinking how, you know, there's a lot of interest in polyculture and a lot of annual polyculture, right? But really, you know, pasture management or pasture mixes already have polyculture going for them. Maybe not quite the same diversity of families, but it's still, especially with the legumes, provides a lot of opportunity for those fungi to complex and they have the ability to not to uh, to be disrupted by any cultivation because it's usually in for like five or ten years or more and yeah. you're absolutely right you said it and and then the thing i would challenge people with perennial pastures is manage them to keep the biodiversity of species in them right because we know that dry years are going to come wet mm-hmm. years are going to come and some of the species we want in dry years, some of the species we want in wet years. So by managing pastures, as we shared earlier in this uh, podcast, mm-hmm. we will have a greater opportunity to keep a biodiverse pasture of species that bring various good traits to the table and simply allow us to rely on a drought avoider Mm -hmm. like a legume that's deeper rooted in a drought where and and rely on some of these grasses and that's why i shared the thought if you're going to put on nitrogen put on some phosphorus or something else too because you got to feed those roots you want to feed a a number of species of perennial forage is not just one grass so narrowly because we do find that um if we it's the same thought of that biodiversity of fertilizer also creates a biodiversity of plants right and if we use a monoculture of fertilizer just nitrogen just nitrogen yeah it's feeding a monoculture of plants so what Dwayne mccartney and shabtai bitman found was that when they simply put nitrogen on they had kentucky bluegrass doing very well along with the smooth brome yeah and there was alfalfa in that mix if i'm not mistaken but when they turned around and put phosphorus with it, they found that the smooth brome became a more dominant species over the Kentucky bluegrass. Instead of enhancing the bluegrass, you had mm-hmm. potential to enhance the smooth brome. Something or, that could be grazed a little more, more or productive. Or the legume. Yeah. So, Interesting. Uh, yeah. So biodiversity of thought, biodiversity of management. And all of that translates back into uh, more consistent, more resilient pastures that can carry you through a dry year, can carry you through a wet year, and at the same time, be more productive and profitable every year. Well, I mean, that's the whole trick, isn't it? To, To stay in business, which means you need profitability. Well, thank you. Is there any other thing you want to cover, possibly? Um, Just all I'd say to people is remember you're managing a a water cycle, a mineral cycle, an energy cycle as part of this. Right. And with that in mind, as we talked about nutrient cycling of manure and urine, we're talking about keeping it on the landscape so that it can be as sustainable a system as possible. Mm-hmm. We're we're also talking about managing plants so that the plants have more leaf area for sunlight capture, right. and that's the energy cycle. And we're also managing for some litter and residual on the surface, so the water cycle is enhanced as well. Protect the and, soil, yeah. And so if we we realize some of this is pretty basic, but if we meet the the goals of those basics mm-hmm. in a perennial system and with our annuals now we're kind of looking to do the same um, with these cocktails and the idea behind it is trying to manage them all so that the biodiversity and the resilience is present in these options so they can handle the droughts or the flooding yeah that's right yes all right well thank you very much grant this has been wonderful It's been a real pleasure talking to you. All right. Well, thank you, Harry, very much for having me. And you take care.